What's good, super friends? It's your tío Pepe from the mean streets of Sunland Park. Hey, dice el feo que quiere tres de tripitas y tres de buche. Sorry about that. Doing my little side hustle here. I've always had the reputation of being the cool uncle. You know, the one that lets you taste his old cough syrup when mom and dad aren't looking. So I always hook you up. I'm back to hook you up again, fam. For only $2 a month, you can skip these annoying ads and get our episodes ad-free and a week early. You'll also be the first to know when I release my MFTs. You've heard of NFTs? These are MFTs, baby. Mexican fungible tokens, vato. The first ones of Rocky Estar y Super Muñeco will be out soon. Shoot me a DM on the DL. Ain't none of Isela and Elena's business, if you know what I mean. We'll also send you stickers a few times a year and shout you out on our show. Link is in the show notes or check us out on patreon.com slash technically a conversation. In December of 1983, a hospital maintenance worker at El Centro Medico de Especialidades in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua was tasked with dismantling old equipment to sell for scrap metal at a local junkyard. What ensued was the largest nuclear disaster in North American history, releasing 100 times more radiation than the partial nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island. Today, we'll discuss how this nuclear disaster happened, how the incident was discovered, and some of the people that were affected on this episode of Technically a Conversation. You're listening to Technically a Conversation, a podcast where we share an interesting topic or story with each other and hope you find it interesting as well. I'm one half of your host, Jose, and I'm joined today by my lovely co host, Isela. How are you doing today? I am most excellent. <laughs> How are you? Doing good also. Elena is still out on assignment this week. We hope to have her back next week. All right. Well, here I am stepping up. That's what I get to do. <laughs> yeah and thank you so much for for filling in appreciate it of course of course how's your black finger doing my black finger does not like this is it's hideous people probably don't know this about me but super friends i actually really enjoy painting my nails a friend of the show right jenster she and i used to go to bars and i would paint we would paint our nails in the bars like as we just drank i really enjoyed painting my nails this looks hideous and it's on the actual finger, not just the nail bed. Oh, I thought it was just on the nail. I'm looking too tough now. Like I'm really from the meat streets of the two foe in El Paso. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you? What's going on? How's your week? Good. Uh, just working. That's about it. Yeah. This is the story of our lives. It is. Don't really have anything interesting or exciting to report. And sadly, no conspiracy theories this episode. Well, no Taylor Swift ones, at least. Mm. But we will have a couple of conspiracy theories at the end of the episode that we can talk about. Oh, but I do want to take a moment to talk about King Charles's official portrait, which was just released yesterday. Oh. And I know that no one follows the royal family as closely as you do, Isela. <laughs> but have you had a chance to see it yet? I have not. Right. I'm like, actually, I painted it. <laughs> yeah, right. I haven't. <laughs> I need to see it now. Okay. I just sent it to you so you could take a look at it. Yeah, I thought I'd come in. I'm almost aware of this craziness. While you're pulling that up, I'll let you know that it is pretty divisive. Now, some people immediately compared it to Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters 2. It definitely gives off <laughs> Ghostbusters 2 vibes. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, some people stated that it looked like a horror movie poster. Personally, I think it looks like Vigo the Carpathian, but pink instead of brown. No, it's painted like in blood. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's that pink goo from Ghostbusters 2 or something. You know how they had that pink ectoplasma oh, yeah. that they were putting oh, in yes. everything? <laughs> right, right. Also, is it me or like his hands look abnormally large? Like he's like, I don't want to be mistaken for Trump. Like I need to get... <laughs> Just kidding. Look at his hands. Don't they look abnormally large? That was one observation that I made. I think his fingers look kind of like the hands of the dead or something. They're so thick. That's what she said. 
They look really puffy, like they're um, little bratwurst fingers or something. <laughs> the rigor mortis is setting in already as, as he's living. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Poor guy. Another observation that I made is that his costume, the, the costume that he's wearing, mm -hmm. it's kind of really hard to make it out from the background because it's almost the same color. Everything's the same color. Yeah, he looks like a floating head. And bratwurst fingers. And then the color that they used on him is very ashy. Like, I'm literally thinking like he's dead. Like, I don't like this one bit. I'm sorry. I'm like shitting all over this painting. <laughs> well, in all fairness, he is kind of ashy himself. So I think that might have been the, the part that they got right. Is, <laughs> is he? That's so funny. Yeah, I have a real hard time liking this. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Wowzers. So I know what most people are saying is that it either looked like a horror movie poster or it looked like Vigo the Carpathian. I don't know if you ever saw Ghostbusters 2. I did. I don't remember much about it, though. That was that painting that that one uh, kind of weird guy was um, w was restoring. Let me send you a picture of the Vigo the Carpathian so you can take a look at it. And as I pull it up, <laughs> right away, there's the comparisons with King Charles's portrait. Oh, see. <laughs> That's so sad. <laughs> that is really sad. The only thing is that the Vigo painting is brown and the King Charles picture is, to me, it looks oh. pink, but I know I have a hard time telling pink and purple apart. I don't think it looks pink. It looks more on the red hue to me, which I guess pink is, but oh, it totally looks like that because it's brown <laughs> on brown. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's hilarious. That's pretty funny, huh? <laughs> I hope he didn't pay for it. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I don't know too much about it. I couldn't get past just the way that it looked like. And I'll put a link in the show notes for if any of our super friends want to take a look at it. Yeah. And super friends, if you look at it, I really want to hear your, like, I want y'all to sound off on this because I want to hear your opinions. <laughs> I know we got some funny listeners out there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Enough fucking Rani Salah. Ready to get started? Of course. Great. Let's get started. Have you ever been exposed to radiation before? Minor amounts. Yes. Like an x-ray or airplane flight. Yeah, I went to the Trinity site as well. Um, there's still like minor, minor amounts there. Speaking of the Trinity site, what's the worst radiation disaster that you're familiar with? Radiation disaster? I I guess it would... No, I... Um, was it Chernobyl? It's kind of hard to fuck with Chernobyl. Yeah, I was going to say it has to be Chernobyl, maybe. Yeah, okay. Did you know that we had a pretty bad radiation disaster in North America? What? Uh Oh, yes, actually, the Three Mile Island. Oh, uh, the Three Mile Island was child's play compared to where we're, we're going to discuss about. <gasps> okay. <gasps> this actually happened here in our area, and it was during our lifetimes. Is that why my eyesight sucks? Damn it, I knew it. <laughs> maybe. Maybe that's why your eyes glow at night. I don't think uh, human eyes are supposed to glow. I thought that was like a charm. That was my charm. <laughs> I'll admit they look super cute. I <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's normal. Damn it. <laughs> Just get, really? So something close by. Very close. The following is from a New York Times article by Sandra Blakesley, a Washington Post article by Robert J. McCartney, and a Today I Found Out video by Simon Whistler. Links in the show notes. The show notes. And every time I say Simon Whistler, I kind of want to do like, Something like yeah. that. Just with the funky word. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. On December 6, 1983, Vicente Sotelo Alardín, an employee of the Centro Médico de Especialidades, a private hospital in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, was tasked with clearing out old equipment in the hospital storage unit. Sotelo was told to sell off what he could and he could keep any money he made from the sale. He got to work dismantling as much machinery as possible to take to El Yonque Phoenix, a junkyard in Juarez across from the Rio Grande in El Paso, Texas. Among the scrap metal he was able to salvage was an unmarked capsule filled with tiny silvery pellets. Sotelo was able to sell all the scrap metal and what remained of the tiny silvery pellets to the junkyard for $9 or $28 in today's money. Unknown to anyone at the time, the tiny silvery pellets were the highly radioactive Cobalt 60 and they were about to be smeltered to create rebar and create one of the largest nuclear disasters in North American history. How did this happen? And what were the repercussions? 
Now, before we go into all the details, Isela, now that I gave you some more background, were you familiar with this story? No, not at all. And, I, and it happened in what is, and this was when? I'm sorry. This was on December 6, 1983. Oh, I mean, we weren't. We were like five when that happened. I wouldn't have remembered. <laughs> but oh my gosh. Okay. I don't think I would have remembered that, but wow, I can't wait to hear all the details. How the hell does this happen? It's a very interesting story. Now, I had never heard about it either, so I was super surprised to come across this. I don't know if the junkyard has changed locations, but according to Google Maps, it's near the Juarez Airport, so it would be near Isleta on the U.S. side, around six or seven miles from Loop 375. One of the most well-known nuclear accidents that happened in the United States was the partial nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. That's the one that you remembered. Mm -hmm. This incident in Juarez released 100 times more radiation than that. Ah, God. Well, that's lovely. Oh my <laughs> God, that's scary. Okay. That's so great, right? Especially since we live right in the area. Yeah, right here. <laughs> All right, you're going to see how this thing spreads really quickly. Now, the thing that makes this incident so hard to study is that in a normal nuclear disaster, one or two people will be exposed to a brief burst of high radiation, but this one is believed to have affected hundreds of people with a low but significant level of radiation over a long period of time. Oh. In case you didn't know, I wasn't aware of this either. Exposure to cobalt-60 is known to cause infertility and leukemia. Oh. Were you aware of that? I did not know that. That's terrible. It is. So let's see what we can find as we go through all the details. Let's first talk about how we got to this point in the story because it's a fucking disaster. And then we'll talk about how it spread and how it was discovered because the discovery part is the crazy part and how many people were estimated to be affected. Sound good? Sure. All right. So how did we get in this mess? It's November of 1977 and El Centro Medico de Especialidades purchased the Picker C3000 which is a radiotherapy unit containing about 6,000 cobalt-60 pellets. The hospital intended to use the machine for cancer treatment, but they were unable to find a specialist that was trained to operate the machine, so it sat in storage for six years. That's sad that it sat there for six years. Juarez is a really large city for Mexico, and they can't attract doctors? That's insane. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> They had doctors, they just didn't have any specialists that were trained to operate this machine. That was the thing that prevented them from using it. But out of six years, you would think that eventually they would get one specialist. I guess. I think after they put it in storage, they just like set it and forget it and nobody thought about it again. Mm. On December 6, 1983, the hospital maintenance manager asked Sotelo to dismantle the unit and sell it for scrap metal at El Yonke Phoenix. Sotelo was able to dismantle most of the unit including the cylinder containing the Cobalt-60. The cylinder was described as looking like a cake decoration, and no one really thought much of it. And I read a lot of conflicting reports on how the cylinder ended up breaking. One of the reports claimed that the cylinder broke in Sotelo's truck, spilling the Cobalt-60 granules into the bed of his truck. <gasps> Another report stated that he drilled the hole into the cylinder while it was in his truck, creating the spill. Another report stated he popped it open with a screwdriver. Oh, geez. I also read a report that stated that Sotelo or one of his co-workers received a burn on their hand from the Cobalt 60. Either way, since the cylinder was now compromised and rolling around the back of Sotelo's truck all the way to the junkyard, the truck was not contaminated. <sighs> and since little grains fell out of the truck and onto the road while driving, the road on the way to the junkyard was also not contaminated as were other vehicles that drove over the pellets and got stuck on the tires, spreading the contamination to other parts of Ciudad Juarez. Oh my goodness, for the love of all cars, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> That's so ridiculous. It's about to get more ridiculous. The junkyard used electromagnets to get the scrap metal out of Sotelo's truck, resulting in the Cobalt 60 sticking to the electromagnets spreading the contamination to other areas of the junkyard. Those granules were attracted to other electromagnetic cranes, causing the cobalt-60 to contaminate other metals in the junkyard. <sighs> now, Sotelo's truck actually ended up breaking down after coming back from the junkyard and ended up sitting immobile outside of his Juarez home for 40 days. <gasps> 
Now, I wasn't able to find if the breakdown was due to the Cobalt 60, but kids being kids would jump in the truck and play in it while it was there broken down. I these poor kids. Wow. The contaminated metal at the junkyard ended up going to two foundries. One was Aceros de Chihuahua, which made rebar. And for those that might not know, rebar is usually used to reinforce concrete at construction sites. The other scraps of contaminated metal were going to the Maquiladora Falcón de Juárez, which manufactures bases for tables. Um, these are the kind of tables that you see in diners and restaurants. Would you like to take a guess, Isela? A gander as to where the rebar and table bases were headed. I'm assuming that the rebar was probably going to be used for some kind of construction, maybe like like another hospital or something. Of course, that would be like the terribly ironic thing. And then the tables, I don't know, to, to some kind of restaurant chain or something? No, actually, it was much more widespread than that. The rebar and the table bases were on their way to the United States and the interior of Mexico. What the hell? Yeah, by January of 1984, it had already been exported. On January 16th, 1984, a radiation detector at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico went off when a truck carrying rebar produced by Aceros de Chihuahua passed by the entrance. <sighs> Wonderful. Just to give you an idea of how radioactive this truck was, between 300 to 450 rams of radiation is enough to give someone radiation poisoning and kill them. The truck was emitting 1,000 rams or over three times the lethal limit. Oh, how is the driver still driving? That's insane. <laughs> That's the part that I want to know, honestly. I don't know how the, the driver didn't die. Wowzer. Uh, yeah, I thought you were going to be like, it was so bad that he was see-through <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> he became a mutant or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was driving with three arms. <laughs> he became Master Splinter of the uh, Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And that's where that started at the end. <laughs> oh, shit. Local authorities realized it was the rebar that had set off the radiation detectors, and they notified Mexico's National Commission of Nuclear Safety and Safeguards, who ordered Aceros de Chihuahua to suspend distribution of rebar and also close the junkyard. Their investigation found that Aceros de Chihuahua had produced an estimated 6,600 tons of rebar that had already been shipped out. Oh, that's a ton. It is. And they also found that in addition to Falcón, which was the Juarez Maquiladora, making table bases with the contaminated metal, some of the contaminated metal also made its way to factories in Gomez Palacios, Monterrey, and San Luis Potosí, and an estimated 30,000 table bases had already been shipped. Oh my, but they knew where they were going. Like, this is at least something they could be like, uh, whoopsie, can we get those back? <laughs> 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 we'll see. Let's find out, Isela. All right. Yeah. I'm jumping the gun. Yeah, you're jumping the gun a little bit, but I like where your mind is headed. All right. So let's go ahead and take a quick commercial break. And when we return, We'll talk about recovering the contaminated rebar on table bases and some people that were affected by this radiation. Uh oh. If you like true crime, dark history, the haunted and paranormal, then we think you'll like Ghost Town. Ghost Town is hosted by me, Rebecca Lieb, and me, Jason Horton. We cover both notorious and obscure true crimes, the haunted, paranormal, and unexplained, and the dark history of everything from world events to pop culture. There are new episodes of Ghost Town every Wednesday and Friday. Find out for yourself what Vulture.com called essential listening and one listener called a total waste of time. So pause the podcast you're listening to right now. And go subscribe to Ghost Town for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And at ghosttownpod.com. Hey, this is Smith from The Story Of. Join myself and my co-hosts Mike, Camp, Bill, and Joe on an exhilarating journey through the unknown, the bizarre, and the extraordinary. Every week we delve into a new topic armed with individual research and a passion for storytelling. The folks here's the twist. We share nothing that we have found with each other until we meet up to record. We're going to uncover conspiracies from the Montauk Project to alien encounters with U.S. presidents. We'll peel back the layers of mystery and expose the truth, or at least our best theories. Weird history on Earth, forgotten tales, 
unsolved mysteries and historical oddities from out of place artifacts to history's weirdest jobs. We got sports sagas. Dive into the stories behind iconic teams' names and scandals that rock the sports world. Join us for Beyond the Ordinary from Bigfoot to Time Travel. We'll explore the fringes of reality and challenge what you think you knew. So grab your headphones, settle in, and let Smith's wit, Mike's curiosity, camp skepticism, Bill's enthusiasm, and Joe's dry humor guide you through the story of where we have found that there's more to history than what's in the books. Available on all major platforms. Subscribe now and let the stories begin. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> I am Vigo, the scourge of Carpathia, the <laughs> sorrow of Moldavia, command you. <laughs> <laughs> How was your break, Isela? I hope our Romanian people, I don't know if that's a Romanian <laughs> accent. I hope they don't take offense. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I actually haven't seen Ghostbusters 2 in decades, so I don't even know if that's the way he talked anymore. Oh, okay. Well, hey. I believed it and I haven't watched it in, jeez, I don't even know, a couple decades. <laughs> I just like saying Vigo the Carpathian. It sounds cool. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. There's sometimes they're just words, to, fun words to say. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. How was yours? How was your break? Good. Just trying to buy some radioactive rebar on eBay. Uh, what about you? Did you have any luck finding any radioactive <laughs> rebar or table bases during our break? No, but I think I was legit finding myself getting like somewhat anxious i was like oh my god this is awful <laughs> so, wow so what are your thoughts so far now that you're thinking that this is awful i mean the story's great because i had not heard of it and how did i not know that something huge like this happened it really feels like our backyard and that just doesn't go away quickly so i'm dying to know what this path of recourse was how long it took, how far spread was, you know, its impact. Ugh, I'm just like, I want to know. And at the same time, I don't want to know <laughs> one of those things. Well, to answer one of those questions, Vermont, but let's back up a little bit. Vermont, <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> that sucks. One of the biggest hurdles in trying to contain this mess was trying to gather the radioactive metal that had already shipped out. And this was a huge nightmare for both the U.S. and Mexican governments. The table legs were a little bit easier to find since they weren't buried under concrete. But by the time both governments had figured out how widespread this whole problem was, radioactive table legs were found as far north as Vermont. Jeez. So that answers one of your questions. Right. Houses and buildings that had been built using the radioactive rebar had to be completely demolished. Some people were already living in the houses, and mm. even though the rebar was encased in concrete, they still emitted enough radiation that they would have given the residents of the homes leukemia within a year, according to Mexican health officials. That's terrible. And I hate, I know this is going to be really mean what I say, but I feel like there's always some kind of corruption going on over there in like high places that, so if they say a year, they really mean like a month. That's like the truth. We'll probably get to the corruption maybe in like in 10 minutes. We there's still so far there's no corruption. Maybe 20 minutes we'll get to the corruption. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so far everything is above the board actually. All right. Okay. And again, the rebar is encased in concrete and that's still how powerful the radiation was. As you might expect, the radiation was the strongest by far in El Yonke Phoenix junkyard and some of its 60 workers had received exposure of between 400 and 500 rems. And again, reminder, 300 to 450 rems is enough to be lethal. Now, I think the reason that these people didn't die immediately, and, and this is just my theory, is normally when people are exposed to radiation, they're exposed to a large amount in one blast. And I think these people were exposed to, I mean, I don't want to say they were moderate amounts, they were large amounts, but it was over a long period of time. So I think that's how they built up those 400 to 500 rems. That's just my theory, because if 300 is enough to kill some people, I mean, how can these people be exposed to 500 rems? I don't know. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. Yeah, it's a fair point, I think, for sure. At least two of the workers, Agustin Villanueva and Pedro Torres, 
were sterile from the exposure. It's unknown if the damage was permanent, as not a lot of follow-up studies have been published. At the time the Washington Post interviewed the men, they were told that if they remained sterile for four months, it would be permanent. And only two months had passed when they were interviewed, but they had been sterile both months. Oh. Yeah, so that's tough. I know one of the guys was 17. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was crushed. One of the other men, I think he was like 27, and he already had one kid. But um, I mean, that's still super young, you know, 27. And the 17-year-old hadn't even started to live. Well, unless it was like you, the 17-year-old Jose was like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that's a good theory, but I'm going to kill that theory right now. Okay, great. <laughs> Some of the other junkyard workers, much like you, had dark spots on their fingernails and toenails that resulted okay. from the radiation exposure. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is a part where I'm going to kill the, the fun-loving 17-year-old Jose. Okay. 10 of the 60 men admitted that they felt tired and they lost their sex drive since the incident. Oh, that's sad. Oh, God, that's it's really heartbreaking. Yeah. One of the men, Daniel Green, criticized the health system, saying that they were just taking their blood over and over, but were never given any treatment. And the reasoning that these people were given for constantly drawing their blood was to monitor that they did not develop leukemia from the exposure or that their white blood cells hadn't dropped since white blood cells are needed to combat infection. At least 10 of the people exposed to the radiation that were tested did have chromosome damage, but I wasn't able to find if it was the same 10 men or if this was a different set of 10 people. Got it. The three men that operated the scale at the junkyard showed the sharpest drop in white blood cell counts and health officials feared for their lives. <laughs> but thankfully, they returned back to normal three months after the contamination was discovered. Like they went back to work? No, no, their bl white blood cell counts. Oh, went back to normal. Correct. They dropped so low that they thought that they were going to die. They didn't think they were going to make it, but, you know, thankfully they, they did. And they were kind of hoping the same thing would happen to those two men that were sterile, that after a few months, the sterility would revert. Mm -hmm. Then they'd start producing semen or something. Mm -hmm. Correct. But at the, the time that this was done, that had not happened. Oh, that's sad. It is. Especially, you know, if your goal in life is to have a family. And I mean, let's just be honest. Our culture, Mexicans, really, I feel like that's just so, it's embedded in us early. Like your family, when you have a family. And I remember they, I felt like they pushed that on me even like really young. Up until I was like 25, I was like, I don't want to have kids. But, you know, things started changing around 26, 27, 28. Those, I was like, well, maybe I do. But yeah, that's, it's, it's in us. It's in our culture. Yeah, it is definitely a cultural expectation, for sure. At least 200 other people were exposed to the radiation, but according to the New York Times, it was believed that it was low enough that it didn't pose long-term health effects. And the thing about the chromosome tests, however, is that they only test if there was damage to the chromosomes, but are not a long-term indicator or predictor of genetic effects or future cancers. Mm. So that's the the bad thing, especially back in the 1980s when they were doing the testing. The only thing you could tell from the test was that there was damage to the chromosomes, but they weren't sure if this was going to lead to future problems. Ay, that's so terrible. So that's why they just kept monitoring. Yeah, the two things that they were most at risk of getting as far as what they knew at the time was leukemia and then becoming sterile. So I think those were the two things that they were constantly monitoring. Got it. Okay. Now, I don't know if you've been to Juarez recently, but <laughs> when you think of a park in Juarez, what's the name of the most popular and most visited park that comes to your mind? Um, that big one here. What is it called? Uh, God, something with a C. El Chamizal? Yeah. Remember that. Okay. Okay, remember we we're talking about Sotelo's pickup truck, the one that the kids would jump on to play? Mm -hmm, the one that broke down. Exactly. That was so severely contaminated that the government didn't even know what to do with it at first. Oh, jeez. That's, that's <laughs> atrocious. It is, but it's going to get much more atrocious right now. It gave off so much radiation, it was nicknamed the hottest truck in Mexico. <laughs> and since they couldn't figure out what the fuck to do with this truck, because I guess they had never experienced anything that gave off so much radiation, they said, well, while we figure out what to do with it, we'll put it in the chamisal with a makeshift fence around it to keep people from getting close to it. That sounds like a good idea, right? That's exactly the joke I was going to make. That's a great idea. Oh, my God. 
why are the dumbest people in <laughs> holding these jobs? <gasps> That's awful. Yeah, I think it was just unprecedented. And, and you got to keep in mind, Mexico is not a nuclear country. They don't have any nuclear power plants. They don't have any nuclear weapons. So they're not a country that's prepared to face one of the biggest nuclear disasters to ever happen in North America. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I get that there's no training, but I feel like even common sense would say, get this to the outer limits of the city or, you know, someplace very desolate. I agree. Or at least if they're going to do that, put it in the middle of the chamisal and just close the whole fucking chamisal. Don't let anybody get close. But yeah, you're, you're right. The thing would be to get it out of the city limits. Yeah, man. Those special crews were also sent out to sweep up the highways after the United States Department of Energy flew a helicopter over the highway from Juarez to Chihuahua and found 22 radioactive sites. It also took two months to clean all the contamination from the Phoenix junkyard as the Cobalt 60 was literally spread everywhere by those magnetic oh, cranes. <gasps> oh my God. And you know what? Like, wouldn't that be a way to identify where they are? Like with, I mean, I don't know if it's just like something out of like a, like a movie or something, but wouldn't they have those like detectors that would tell you like, whoa, you know, this is a really, this is a hot spot, and this is okay or whatever. Like the Geiger counters? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's the same type of radiation. I, I want to say that the cobalt 60 gives off gamma rays, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'm not sure if that's the same type of radiation that Geiger counters are able to, to pick up. But at least the radiation detectors that they had in Los Alamos was able to pick it up. So I really don't know. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Well, thank goodness for Los Alamos. Those nerds are on it, man. That's awesome. <laughs> it is. <laughs> And I haven't gotten to the weird part yet. There's going to be a little twist here. It's, okay. it's going to be a one of Jose's Midnight Shyamalan twists. Oh, Midnight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm the bootleg M. Night Shyamalan. Midnight Shyamalan. <laughs> right. Mexican Night Shyamalan. <laughs> the Mexican M. Night Shyamalan. Actually, it's not so much of a twist, but it's going to be funny how they found out, how Los Alamos actually found out about it. That's going to be the weird part. Okay. Okay, so eventually it was decided to bury the contaminated rebar, metal, table bases, and dirt from the junkyard and highway, along with Sotelo's truck in the Samalayuca Desert, which is 25 miles from the center of Juarez. Being only 25 miles, as you can imagine, there was a lot of opposition to this, and the people were saying that it was too close to Juarez. The only bright side to having done that is that Cobalt 60 only has a half-life of five years. So every five years, it's half as radioactive as it once was. And in 25 years, it would be considered to be safe. I mean, there would still be radiation emitting from it, but it would be safe for people to be around. Mm. So being that this happened 40 years ago, I think people are safe now. But even this grave site at the Samalayuca Desert was a total fuck up. Oh, Lord. <laughs> According to the Autonomous University of Mexico, and satellite images of the Samalayuca grave site, it didn't appear like there were any precautions put in place to keep the radiation from contaminating the groundwater, and the grave site was improperly built. Usually when they bury anything radioactive, it's encased in concrete. Based on the satellite images, it appeared like they just dug a hole and dumped all the shit in there. Oh my gosh. And the really fucked up part is that it wasn't even covered until recently when they covered it with sand. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. They just did such a half-assed job. What the heck? It was super half-assed. And then you know how windy it gets here. So imagine radioactive sand flying everywhere. <laughs> right. I'm sure it's like in my teeth when I smile and whatnot. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The only thing is that I hope that they were right about it being safe after 25 years because we're definitely breathing that in whenever we get one of those dust storms. It really does make me question if, because I have family that lives closer to the Sleta area, and it does make me question if any of them have had any like weird symptoms. Who knows? I mean, being seven miles away from, from the Yonke, I mean, I, I think that's still close enough that you could feel some of the radiation. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Interesting. All right. So here's the whole punchline of this. <laughs> yeah, this is a riot so far. <laughs> <laughs> 
don't want to say that it was funny, but this was like the, the weird part. This whole thing was discovered by accident. Let me explain. The truck with the rebar that set off the radiation alarm at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico only set off the alarm because it had taken a wrong turn. Had they had Google Maps, had they not taken a wrong turn, had they gone straight to their destination and passed by Los Alamos, this incident would have probably never been discovered. Oh, wow. No way. Oh, Lord. Can you imagine how long that would have taken? Or who knows if we would have ever discovered that? No, because apparently nobody knew what, what the fuck it was. Yeah, people just getting sick left and right. Yeah, I mean, the maintenance workers didn't know what it was. The people at the junkyard didn't know. They had already shipped off all the scrap metal to be turned to rebar and table bases. So people would have been exposed to this long term, longer than 25 years that it would be considered safe. Had that <sighs> truck not taken a fucking wrong turn. See, thank God for wrong turns. That's why some mistakes are not mistakes, people. We should ban Google Maps for sure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So yeah, so that's like the big punchline to all this. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is, that's fascinating because I think if it went all the way up to Vermont, it would have affected all of America then. All of North America, um, because it's not just there. Yeah, that was as far north as they found table bases. Lord, and and Mexico, jeez. Yeah, so it had pretty much spread all over the place. Wow. I guess talk about effective uh, logistics. They're like, boom, get it out of here. Go, go, go. (laughs) Yeah. Another wrong turn was uh, for Sotelo, because sadly, he became the scapegoat in this whole incident, as he claims that he was just following orders. But nevertheless, the Centro Medico de Especialidades made Sotelo sign a confession saying he took the Picker C-3000 without authorization, and he was fired from his job. (gasps) Sotelo maintains his innocence and stated the machine was not properly labeled, stating that it was radioactive or dangerous. And what I learned from uh, the Today I Found Out video, they said that, um, you know, aside from Sotelo just like puking his his face off for a while and, and, uh, you know, having like bad diarrhea and all that, uh, he actually had remarkable health. So um, So he bounced back as well. He bounced back. Yeah. That's the only like, uh, I guess, follow up um, information I could find on any of these people. Well, that's just as shocking because I would have imagined that he would have been cooked from the inside out. That's what I imagine, too, especially he had the fucking truck parked right outside his home. Uh, Yeah. Oh, my God. This poor man. (laughs) That's, you know what? That could be some kind of divine intervention. Like, hey, you know what? They totally screwed you on you losing your job and signing that forced confession. Because I totally believe Sotelo. Like, obviously, we don't just do things all willy-nilly. It's because someone told us to do it. That's bullshit. Poor dude. He was saying the least I could have done is put a fucking skull on there, you know? But there was nothing on this fucking machine. Nothing. Wow. I believe him. I do believe him. Now, the the whole reason that I found out about this is because I had heard that there was a rumor that some of the contaminated rebar was used to build one of the largest malls in Ciudad Juarez. But the (laughs) owners didn't want to demolish it. So there was a government cover up to hide this from the public and those that were tasked with performing the cleanup of the contaminated areas. And um, the Today I Found Out video did talk about this as well. But sadly, uh, the name of the mall was not given and no sources were provided. So I wasn't able to look into it more. But I had heard about that, about there being a mall in Ciudad Juarez that was made with contaminated rebar. So I was looking up to find more information about it. Again, I don't know if it's true or not, but that is a rumor that, so it's like a, I guess like a conspiracy theory. Oh my God, that's shameful. I mean, I I understand it's expensive to make a mall and whatever, but you should care more about your people than you do the almighty bezel, (laughs) you you know. I agree. The sad reality is that Mexico is very poor. So anytime you have to spend money on something, there's an opportunity for there to be corruption. That's what I think. And I think that's why there is so much corruption there, because people aren't paid living wages. So people do things that would go against their values and ethics because they need the extra money to feed their families. Yeah, like signed a fake confession saying, I took this without anybody else's knowledge. Yeah, and also going back to that one, uh, I didn't write it in the script, but I also believe that it's kind of bullshit because Sotelo was never prosecuted. So if he had taken this as the confession claim that he did, he would have been prosecuted for having stolen it. Mm. So that's why I also think it's bullshit. But um, 
I don't know the the mall that part I can kind of see it being true. What do you think? I can absolutely see it being true. Like you said, it's been a very difficult economy for decades now and you know, I could see if someone goes and puts in a lot of money to make a big place for all this consumerism, they're they don't want to back out of it. They already ugh, that's so terrible. And then especially if their train of thought is like, well, in five years, it's going to be fine. Like, yeah, but think about all the people that are going through those doors or walking on that rebar. I don't know. That's just so awful. It is really bad. There's sometimes no price to pay. Well, that's in their mind. They're like, well, it's only a life or two. Yeah. Or if it was somebody that I just spent my whole life savings building this building and then to have to fucking demolish it and build it again. I don't have that money to rebuild it. Fuck it. Let's pay off some people so that, that way they uh, keep their mouths shut. Oh, God, that just sits so awful with me. Ugh, like I can feel it in my gut. That feels so terrible. So pretty cool, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, but it was really interesting because I had no idea on any of this. That's so widespread. It's insane. It is. Yeah. Wow. All right. So for us not to end on a downer here, <laughs> this week's whiskey pick is going to be a scotch, since I know that you're very classy, Sela, so I imagine you being more of a scotch lady than a bourbon person. Okay. <laughs> now, unlike my last scotch pick, which was a single malt, this one is a blended scotch, meaning that they blend many different single malts together to arrive at a certain flavor profile, and they dilute it with grain alcohol to keep it affordable. Mm. Grain alcohol would be something like um, Everclear, you know, something like that. Not saying that it is ever clear, but something like that. So that, that way they can keep the prices down. Sure. This bottle is one of the most purchased bottles in Scotland. So if the Scots like it, it must be good, right? Absolutely. So what we're talking about here, I know you could see me in the video, but for our super friends, what we're talking about is the famous grouse, which is named for the bird that's on the label. Did you know that? I didn't. I was going to ask you about the bird and what's with the fowl. Like there's because wild turkey was on your um, I think that was your pick for fire in the sky. Like, I don't know what's going on with these liquors and the fowls. I honestly don't know why there's an obsession with birds. Maybe because I don't know if, if the famous grouse is a, a hunting bird. So maybe it was something that uh, it was prized because it was particularly good. I don't know. Now, the famous grouse was developed in 1896 by Matthew Glog in Perthshire, Scotland. Oh. His goal was to create the best quality blended whiskey, and it's said to contain Highland Park and the Macallan single malt whiskeys, which both of those are excellent. Personally, the Macallan 12 is one of my favorites, but for $80 in our region, it's pretty <laughs> pricey for being a daily sipper. Yeah. I'm not going to compare this to the Macallan. I've never tried Highland Park, but I'm not going to compare it to the Macallan. The famous grouse doesn't even come close to it as far as flavor is concerned. But for only $23, it's not bad. And I always like having a bottle around for when I'm feeling a little sassy. The tasting notes given by the famous grouse are dried fruit, cinnamon, ginger, and a hint of oak, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so Christmassy. I like this. It does sound Christmassy. Like a warm palate type of thing, yeah. It's not. It, it's very crisp, actually. It's a very crisp scotch. Okay. There is no age statement on the bottle, so it's probably three years old, since that's the minimum to be called a scotch. And it's 80 proof, as you would expect from any um, blended scotch. Uh, so it does go down pretty smooth. Now, the thing that makes the, the famous grouse so interesting, and this is something that probably a lot of people don't know, is that it's owned by a charity. Oh, wait. I thought charities aren't, are they like nonprofits though? So how are they selling this? That's a good question. I don't know if all charities are nonprofits. I think that they just have to, I think for you to be a nonprofit, you have to demonstrate that you just make enough to keep up like the operating costs. But I think that as long as you give like a certain percentage away, you can be called a charity. You wouldn't be called a nonprofit, but you could be called a charity. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. A charity. Wow. It's owned by the Robertson Trust. It's a private company. It's not a public company. And some of the profits are used for numerous things in Scotland, like protecting wildlife, including 
the famous grouse that's on their bottle. Ah, now that makes more sense. Okay. They also pay for higher education for young people with deprived backgrounds. So every time that you purchase a bottle of the famous grouse, you're helping kids attend the higher education. Oh, that's what a fabulous idea. Like here, do something a little bit bad, but feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just knowing that you're doing something small to help up people that are not as privileged, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Their charity also does things with mental health, helping the unhoused, and they do a lot of programs to support soldiers and veterans. That's really noble. It is. And I'm sure it's a pittance of what they make, but I like that they are donating funds to worthy causes. So, um, you know, again, putting that in mind with the $23 price tag, it's hard not to recommend that. I usually drink it neat and it satisfies the desire for scotch when I have one. I'm sure it's probably even better in a cocktail since usually uh, blends are good for cocktails. Would I rather drink a single malt? Of course. But again, for that price, it's super hard to pass it up. And again, think of the children. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I didn't even ask you, have you ever tried the famous grouse, Isela? I have not, no. I think um, the most popular scotch in all the world is Johnny Walker. I want to say it's specifically the red label, but the most popular scotch in Scotland is the famous grouse. Oh, okay. Yeah, that does make sense. Well, I think whenever we all get, uh, when Elena's back from assignment and we all get together to do the tasting, we can all do these little tastings that you're talking about. That would be so much fun. Yeah. Uh, if we record it, it's going to be funny. It'll be very funny. I think that's what Anna wanted to do when she gets back from her assignment. Special shout out to our super homie, super friends, Sophia, Natasha, Eric, Angie, Eli, Madtown Charity, Katya, and Victor. If you want to be super cool and help support the show, Get the episodes a week early and ad-free. Get your name shouted out on the show and get some stickers from us a few times a year. Check us out at patreon.com slash technically a conversation or check the show notes. Mm -hmm. Best of all, it's only $2 a month, baby. You can't even buy cigarettes, the famous grouse, and certainly not a Picker C3000 for that amount. <laughs> you know, everybody <laughs> yeah. wants a Picker C3000. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> You know, to think these guys got $9, I would have fucking given them 10 for that. And then I would have sold that on the black market. Oh my God. I wonder how much it would really have gone for. I don't know. There's no telling. No, I know that they originally acquired it from a hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. There's a lot of like um, trying to pass the blame on it. I didn't really want to go into it, but it, I guess I'm going into it now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going off script here. Watch out now. But um, a hospital in Fort Worth, Texas sold it to the hospital in Juarez because uh, apparently, well, well, what Mexico alleges is that it was cheaper for them to sell it than to pay how much it would have cost to dispose of it. Oh, that's still fucked up too. Yeah, it's, it's fucked up any way you see it. So Mexico is trying to say, well, I think the U.S. kind of gets a, a share of the blame too because- this shouldn't have been sold, I guess, like on the secondary market. It should have been disposed of properly, but who knows? That is a fair statement if that's true. Yeah. No, I, I get it. But I feel like it's also just like everyone's trying to find a scapegoat. And since Isela said scapegoat, we hope that yeah. you enjoyed the show and you join us again next week. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review, tell a friend, and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are sold. Follow us on the socials at GreetingsTAC, email us at GreetingsTAC at gmail.com, or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669. If you have a story of being exposed to lethal levels of radiation, to share <laughs> with us. I hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. <laughs> we, we like our super friends. Why do I always have to take these episodes to such a dark place? I, I don't know. I know, because you're a dark person. Well, thank you. It's your soul. I'm glad that you can see that. <laughs> you noticed? Yeah, you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. On next week's episode of Technically a Conversation. 
Baby Reindeer is a British black comedy drama thriller that was created, written, and starred Richard Gadd, a Scottish comedian, writer, and actor, based on his one-man show of his real-life experiences. It's received a strong viewership and critical acclaim. The names of all the characters in the series were changed to protect anonymity. Supposedly, this was in an attempt to prohibit the exploitation of a stalker, rapist, and other characters in the show. What people are most interested in is that this show is a true story. According to the creator, Richard Gadd, it's not loosely based on facts, but it's all fact with the exception of changing a couple of things here and there to add dramatization. We love to uncover the truth about alleged circumstances. How much of this do you think is true and what parts were inflated so that it was entertaining to a television audience? New episodes drop Monday. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show.